Professor J. Belsky is the Robert M. and Natalie Reed Dorn Professor of uh, Human Development at the University of California, Davis. His main fields of expertise are child development and family studies. More specifically, these include daycare, parent-child relations, and more generally, the effects of early child development experiences and environmental exposures on psychological and behavioral development. <clears throat> I'm very familiar with Jay's work through uh, his work on uh, the evolutionary basis of parent and child functioning. And for many years, he's contributed the entry about evolution in the large, heavy, scholarly handbook of attachment tome that is widely read and reflects the current state of knowledge in this area of uh, infant attachment. Uh, today he'll be talking about a different but related subject of differential susceptibility about which he has written extensively and is quite well known. I'd also like to note that Jay traveled here from his sabbatical in Kyoto, Japan. So I very much appreciate that trip. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Paul. I should add that, you know, my wife said to me, why are you going all this way just to give a 45 minute talk? And I said there were two reasons. One was Paul's very persuasive and persistent. And the other reason is, um, you know, it was a speaker's list of really stars in the field. And I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to learn from them and rub shoulders with them. So thank you, Paul for inviting me and thanks my colleagues for accepting Paul's invitations also. I'm actually gonna talk about two topics today. Um, Paul referred to each of them, although my title doesn't, um, because I have two goals. The first goal is to challenge the view that adverse parenting and other developmental experiences that some boys receive, and some girls too, disrupts, disturbs, and dysregulates dysregulates what otherwise would be normal development, resulting with pro in problems with aggression, delinquency, and the like. We heard a lot yesterday about dysregulation, disorder, disturbance, dysfunction. Um, so I want to challenge that language to a certain extent. To a certain extent. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I also wanted to challenge the implicit claim, and I say this is implicit because it's not really all that explicitly described in many cases, that, that most factors and forces that undermine or even enhance child and adolescent development apply to all children more or less equally. I'm gonna make the argument that children, as Paul referred to and my title refers to, are differentially susceptible to developmental experiences like good or poor parenting or developmental expo exposures like poverty or affluence. So with regard to goal one, for quite some time now, parents, policymakers, and developmental scholars have viewed child developments through the lens of the Enlightenment, more or less presuming that the natural way for children to develop is to become secure, autonomous, achievement-striving, capable of intimacy, and thus able to establish harmonious pair bonds and take good care of their own children when the time came. I contend that this view ignores evolution by Darwinian natural selection while romanticizing child development. As the first goal of all living things, not just humans, but all living things, is to pass genes on to descendants, an evolutionary perspective stipulates that there is no one way or best or optimal way to get this developmental goal of life done, and that how one does achieve this developmental goal depends on the context of development. Thus, what is natural and optimal is what gets the job done, not some predisposed, presupposed notion of who humans are supposed to be. This way of thinking led me to advance any number of years ago an evolutionary model of socialization, one, one which put reproduction in center stage. This model included a unique prediction that no other model of socialization would even consider or be able to account for if it proved to be true. 
and that's whether we're talking about attachment theory or social learning theory or life course sociological theory or any other prevailing perspective on how and why children develop the way they do. The model and the unique prediction are outlined in the next slide. And what you see here is a distinction between what I want to call fast and slow life history or reproductive strategies. And what you see right from the start is nothing surprising. It's very common, it's very familiar. We've been, it's been referred to implicitly, not this framework, but these ideas already. So on the one hand, we have the expectation in the slow developmental strategy, not that most developmentalists think about it as slow, that under conditions of resourcefulness, spousal harmony, adequate um, um, economic resources, parents tend to be sensitive, supportive, responsive, and positively affectionate. And this promotes a secure attachment, a trusting internal working model in Bowlby's sense, and a reciprocally rewarding, rewarding, mutually beneficial orientation to relations with others. And in consequence, these individuals who have this um, benevolent exposure, if you would, tend to become sexually active later than the others, tend to engage in more likely long-term enduring pair ponds, and tend to have greater parental investment, care for their children in ways that we would consider better. In contrast, we can see a fast reproductive strategy under conditions of marital discord, high stress, inadequate resources financially and otherwise. We're more likely to see harsh, rejecting, and sensitive and inconsistent care. Producing, producing the prob increased probability of insecure attachment, a mistrustful internal working model, and an opportunistic advantage-taking orientation to social relations, all of which would eventually contribute to earlier onset of sexual activity, more likely short-term unstable pair bonds, and limited parental investment, that is, attention and sensitivity and time spent caring for children. Now, there's nothing in this representation here that's inconsistent with so much of what we heard yesterday and what is the prevailing understanding of, quote, good and bad parenting and supportive and unsupportive contextual conditions and therefore, quote, optimal and compromised, dysfunctional, dysregulated, disordered development. But that framework doesn't offer this hypothesis about physical development. That over here, we're going to get on the right side on slow. We're going to get slower maturation and pubertal development. And here, what we're going to do is get accelerated pubertal development. Why? Because under conditions of risk, the argument goes, the future, the organism understands that the future is precarious. My probability of getting to reproductive age is compromised. The quality of my capabilities are compromised. So when it comes to securing mates, I may have less competitive advantage in the mate market. Therefore, if I'm facing those risks and uncertainties, hurry up and get to maturity sooner. Because that's what development, that's what natural selection and evolution cares about. Passing on genes, not health and happiness, as a more traditional point of view would presume. Okay, I want to provide some quick evidence then um, that different types of developmental adversity prove related to pubertal timing because that's the unique prediction that this theoretical prediction, that this theoretical perspective advanced before there was any data regarding it. And it's also the empirical finding that if it's confirmed, none of these traditional theories can explain. So from a philosophy of science perspective, that shows the inadequacy of those theories. Okay, so here's data from a large-scale study that was never intended as a study of puberty, but one of child care effects, in which we discovered that early infant attachment security predicted accelerated pubertal development, age of menarche in girls, such that um, girls who were insecure, you see in the top two bars, were more likely to have a pubertal onset under two years of age, 10 and a half years of age. And in the bottom two bars, the same insecure girls were more likely to complete puberty by 13 and a half years of age. Now, there's nothing in traditional attachment theory that suggests that you should get this kind of association. And just to echo what Sarah had to say, it's an association. Nevertheless, it's incredibly suggestive, and it suggests that we have to expand our, notion, expand our notion of what attachment development may be all about. Here we have a study that also wasn't intended to address this question, but the investigators looked at it because they were interested in alcoholic families. But nevertheless, 
what they found was that maltreatment accelerates female pubertal development such that maltreated girls are reaching a mature stage of pubertal development based on a number of um, physical development sim um, signals a half a year or so before non-pubertal, non non-maltreated girls. Again, our psychosocial theories don't lead to that expectation. A reproductive strategy theory, one that emphasizes the centrality of reproduction in living organisms, including humans, does. Here's evidence, to my surprise, because after years of following this literature and having initiated it, all of a sudden we see evidence of male de pubertal development being related also to contextual conditions. And here, this is a huge study carried out in a national birth cohort in Australia showing a dose-response relationship between household socioeconomic position, SES, affluence if you would, or lack thereof, and timing of puberty in boys and girls. And as ecological conditions get more compromised, severe, risky, to the left-hand bar on this, on this figure, um, the earlier we have pubertal development. But as Sarah said, these are observations. What we really need, ideally, are experiments. Um, but nobody's going to let us abuse children or take things away from them in order, with, in order that we can see if it affects pubertal development. As it turns out, two natural experiments have been conducted, kind of like um, the semi-natural experiment that Sarah described with lead, it wasn't so natural because policy created the lead timing differences. Here we have nature creating differential exposures. In the first study, we're dealing with an earthquake in China, which randomly assigned some children to exposure and some children to not exposure. Earthquake exposure increased risk of early puberty at age 11 or earlier for both boys as measured by age of first ejaculation and girls in terms of menarche. Here we have an older study stimulated by the very theory I advanced early on in which the investigators went back and looked at what happened to children who were taken from their families voluntarily, their families in, the, in World War II, and they went from Norway to Sweden. Uh, rather, they went from, this is the Helsinki birth cohort, they went from Finland to Sweden in the search of safety. Lo and behold, as adults, those who were formally evacuated from the war zone had earlier menarche, earlier first childbirth for men, more children by late adulthood women, and shorter interbirth intervals, again for men, than those not separated. In other words, the experience of separation was hypothesized here to be an early adversity stressor. And lo and behold, we see reproductive pubertal development outcomes associated with that. Again, prevailing conceptualizations can explain this. Conclusion. The primary goal of all living things is to pass genes onto descendants, either directly through their own children and grandchildren, or indirectly through their nieces, nephews, cousins, and kins. The concept of inclusive fitness. We have to consider that not only the genes of ours that we pass down, but our kin pass down, because we share genes with our kin. This biological gravity structures the nature of child and adoles adolescent and adult development, I would argue, such that, to repeat, when risks to survival and well-being are encountered, the evolutionary strategic thing to do is mature early, engage in sex sooner, bear more children, and care for them less intensively. Why? Because one's power to shape their chances of surviving and reproducing in the future may be quite limited due to poverty, racism, etc. By having many offspring, one increases the chances that some will eventually bear their own offspring, thereby enhancing parent and child reproductive success. Let me underscore here that there's no assumption that people are rationally, logically thinking this through. This isn't, you know, a prefrontal cortex process. This is an old brain process. Um, and so I would argue that what we ought to be looking at are rapidly maturing brains, and we heard some of that, and there's now more and more biological evidence. I have a paper coming out in Current Directions in Psychological Science looking at a whole range of biological areas in which we see adversity accelerating biological development, so it's a, and thereby it looks like pubertal development. And this may also explain why early adversity in life undermines physical health later in life. The prevailing notion is that, well, adversity is just wear and tear and grinds the system down. 
I would argue, nope, we're back in the Enlightenment idealization of development thinking. Rather, what's going on is that under adversity, what we've evolved to do is re-regulate development. Not dysregulate it, not create disorder, not generate dysfunction, engender different ways of being that fit the anticipated environment. Sarah put up that lovely slide showing that abused kids have, you know, heightened threat exposure sensitivity. Makes all the sense in the world. We know that maltreated kids engage in more aggression. Well, hit first, ask questions later. You know, one of the things we do when we think about adversity is we compare the kids who have suffered some adversity with some ideal alternative for kids who haven't. I would say the proper comparison is the alternative dysfunctions they're not showing. That is, the strategic alternative ways of developing may be the best hand you can play with the cards you've been dealt. And they're better than some of the alternatives. That's the comparison, not some ideal situation where development wasn't open to them. So I really think we have to think more about the function of what children are doing in response to their environments and what their bodies are doing, rather than kind of moralizing it, um, as we implicitly do when we start talking about dysregulation, disorder. Okay. But I also want to argue that everything I've just said is both right and wrong. And the reason it's both right and wrong is because it applies to some and not others. That there is differential susceptibility to the kinds of environmental influences we've been hearing all about, including the ones I've been talking about. The traditional theoretical model of how environmental factors, including those experienced early in development, shape human development is the dual risk model of environmental action. We've heard a lot about that. You've got organismic limitations, prematurity, poor executive functioning, um, sort of um, limited other functions, and then you get exposed to contextual risk, and it break, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And here we see it demarcated. Do I have that? Where's the IT guy? Where's the, is he here? Oh, can you see my cursor? Oh, Jesus, he was supposed to set this up. Because, okay, what you see here is the classic diathesis stress or dual risk model. That those who carry a, an organismic vulnerability, they're negatively emotional, they carry a particular gene, they're physiologically dysregulated, quote. That under, on the right-hand side of the graph, under positive environmental conditions, there's no risk between those who have this latent vulnerability and those who don't. But under conditions of adversity, now that separates, so to speak, the men from the boys. Because now those who have the latent vulnerability under adversity on the left-hand side, under negative contextual conditions, they succumb to that adversity. They're the vulnerable ones. But the others don't. And that, by definition, is resilience. They face the same ecological or developmental or family conditions, but they don't succumb. And as we'll see, this heterogeneity characterizes our exposures, which is maybe why our effect sizes are limited, because we're putting together those who are affected and those who aren't, and why our intervention effect sizes are modest, because we're putting together those who are more and less susceptible. But here are two evolutionary questions challenging the sensibility of this long-standing traditional, I would say up to a point, very useful dual risk model. Again, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I want to change the direction of how we think about the nature of development. The first is, why would nature craft a developmental system for generating, quote, disturbances in development, dysfunctions, disorder? But more intriguing is one that we never question, even. Why would natural selection craft an organism whose future functioning is influenced by its earlier experiences? That's the core premise of so much of what we're doing here. And most of us would say, well, we're being shaped by our exposures to prepare us for tomorrow. And I think that makes good logical sense, quite frankly. But what we have to consider is that the future is inherently uncertain. So a mismatch between the early experiences and your later life conditions can occur. And under those conditions, that would undermine the reproductive and other success 
due to a bad fit between how the individual has developed and what it's prepared for and the world it has actually encountered. I think the most dramatic evidence of this is the killing fields of Cambodia. Because the first people the Khmer Rouge murdered when they pushed everybody out of the city, uh, cities in Cambodia after the fall of Vietnam, and they took over Cambodia, was people like us. Uncalloused hands, spectacles, because those were markers of education. So who got killed first? People like us. People whose parents told them, study hard, go to school, follow your teacher's instructions, do your homework. In other words, that turned out not just to be a figurative, but a literal dead end. And who had a greater chance of surviving, including to breed in another day? Those who didn't get with that traditional program of education, of socialization, of maturation. Who didn't go to school, who didn't do their homework, who are, quote, bad sorts. Because the future turned out different. This observation of the uncertainty of the future led me to hypothesize that nature would hedge its bets, making some of us more and others less developmentally plastic or malleable, that is, susceptible to environmental influences, leading to the following alternative conceptualization of differential susceptibility. Now we see that those who are most vulnerable to adversity, this is the dotted red line on the left side, like the vulnerability model, however, should be highly susceptible on the upside. That is, they should be developmentally plastic, I'm hypothesizing, for better and for worse. They suck more nutrients out of support and enrichment and even benign conditions, and they get, adver they get undermined more by bad conditions. What's especially interesting about this framework is it also implies that resilience as currently conceptualized isn't an inherent good across all conditions. Because the very kids who will prove invulnerable and resilient to adversities may prove non-responsive to intervention effects. Well, it's one thing to advance a theoretical framework, again, before there's any evidence of it. And it's another thing to see whether there's any empirical support for it. I want to go through a series of observational evidence, first looking at infants' negative emotionality, because that looks like it's a plasticity factor, and then genetic factors um, from observational studies, and then I'm going to turn to experimental evidence, all of which seems consistent with a differential susceptibility notion. Negative emotionality has been long conceptualized as a vulnerability factor, as a risk. Kids who are, have a difficult temperament, who are difficult to soothe, who cry a lot, hard time settling. I had one of these kids. Um, you know, I came away from the experience, quite frankly, wondering why there wasn't more child abuse. Because I felt like strangling that kid all too often. Um, but look what happens here. It looks like what we've missed for years is that while it's true that negatively emotional kids are more vulnerable to adversity, they look like they benefit more from enrichment. Here we have the effects of maternal positive and negative parenting at age nine months, predicting the externalizing problem on IQ at three years of preterm infants. And we're distinguishing those who are high and low in negativity um, at nine months. So there are two lines in each graph. In the top graph, the more slanted line is showing us that under good conditions, the highly negative kids have the fewest problems and I wish I had a pointer here, um, and the, but the same kids under bad conditions have the most problems. The flat line is the kids who aren't highly negative. Good conditions, bad conditions make no difference. We see the same thing in reverse when we're looking at IQ. The highly negative kids under supportive conditions are flourishing. Under bad conditions, they're compromised. The other kids, the adverse or the support, ends up water off a duck's back. Here we see the same kind of thing with marital conflict and, and, and behavior change, change in behavior problems from age two to three, moderated by temperamental irritability. The solid line is the irritable kids. Under high conflict, they show the most increase in problems. Under low conflict, they show the most decline in problems. For the kids who aren't temperamentally irritable, growing up with conflicted parents or parents who get along, water off a duck's back makes no difference. I'm going to come back to this theme again and again, so if you want to take a quick nap, feel free. Here we've done the same thing looking at quality of childcare. Um, 
The kids who, at three and six months, were, had difficult temperaments are affected for better and for worse by better and poor quality childcare. The kids who aren't negatively emotional are not. The theory of childcare quality is it affects everybody. The evidence seems to suggest that's not the case. And here's, we have the same thing. Now we're looking at conflict with the teacher in grade one and looking at symptom severity change from grade one to seven. The same storyline. Those who have a reactive inhibited temperament, they're easy to distress, they're easily upset, they're affected for better and for worse, the other kids aren't. I want, now I want to look at genetics. This is going to overlap with some of what Sarah said. But I want to highlight that Sarah's framework, and I think it's right some of the time, because again, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, is the dual risk one. We've got some genetic vulnerability, and we've got some adversity, and boom, then you get problems. And we're going to go right to the same serotonin transporter gene, I think that Sarah or somebody else mentioned, and this is often thought of or has been thought of as the depression gene. Well, here we have a study of adolescents who had more African-American adolescents growing up in the rural South. Their perceived racial discrimination on their conduct problems. Those who had one genetic set of variants, carrying sh what's called short alleles, and we don't have time to go into those details, but one set of variants of genes are highly affected by whether or not they get perceived racial discrimination. When there's a lot of racial discrimination, there's a lot of conduct disorder. I'm looking at the red line here on the right side. When there's little racial dis perceived racial discrimination, they have the least problems. I'm looking at the red line on the left side. But if you don't carry those, those genetic variants but alternative ones, perceived racial discrimination has no effect. Here we see the same thing going on, but this time we're taking it's a much bigger population, and the question is how much drinking goes on in your high school? And then, how much alcohol do you consume? And alcohol consumption at the school level, the average amount of alcohol that the average adolescent is consuming, is affecting the individual alcohol consumption if you're susceptible, that is, you're carrying these short um, serotonin transporter alleles. But if you're not carrying them, how much drinking is going on in your high school has no influence on your own drinking, apparently. Go to a different gene. This is the dopamine receptor gene, often thought of for a long time as an ADHD gene. And now we're looking at prenatal stress, which we've seen repeatedly as a risk factor for all sorts of problems in development. Does it predict antisocial behavior? Well, we saw evidence over the last yesterday that it does. But it turns out, it looks like, that it does variably. For those who have what is called the seven repeat variant, and especially two copies of it, inherited one from mother and one from father, their antisocial behavior is for better and for worse, depending upon whether they had more or less prenatal stress. For other kids with only one or no of these variants, there's no effect of prenatal stress. So does prenatal stress seem to affect antisocial behavior? The answer is yes and no. Yes for some, not for others. Here we have um, showing the same thing. Now we're looking at responsive, supportive parenting, predicting adolescent self-regulation. In the top graph we're seeing, that the more respon if, that if that if you're carrying the seven repeat version of this genetic th this polymorphism, then you're affected for better and for worse for supportive and lack thereof parenting. But if you're not carrying those variants, that same influential parenting is not exerting a parent developmental influence on your self-regulation. Now the truth is, we all carry numerous polymorphisms. That is genes that vary across us. So the question becomes, in the same way we put contextual risks together to create cumulative risk variables, what if we put supposed plasticity genes, genes that make you more and less susceptible to environmental influence together, to make cumulative plasticity indices, or what now go by the name of polygenic scores? Look at this. Here we're looking at the extent to which the social environment across four waves of data collection was advantaged or disadvantaged, advantage on the right side, disadvantage on the left side, in predicting adolescent ingression. And now we're putting together both of the two polymorphisms that we've seen before, short alleles on the serotonin transporter gene and seven repeat alleles on the dopamine receptor gene. And lo and behold, what do we see? That you can have 
two, one, or zero of these susceptibility alleles. The more of these alleles you have, the more you're affected, it looks like, for better and for worse. And what's critical about this scale is it belies the notion that there are, and this isn't my terminology, orchids and dandelions. Because that suggests that there are two kinds of people, in the same way that my fast and slow strategy did. But what this suggests is we shouldn't think typologically like that. What we probably have is a gradient of developmental plasticity. In the same way, we probably have a gradient of reproductive strategies going from fast to slow. This is a continuous variable. It's not a categorical variable. Here we see the same thing in a piece of work I did, looking at parenting and it affecting adolescent self-control as measured cognitively, emotionally, and behaviorally. And here we've put together five different polymorphisms. And I was astonished when I saw these data, because I didn't analyze these data. Somebody else had these data, asked me what we should do. I laid out a plan, he implemented, and what do we see? We see the, from the yellow line to the blue line to the, I'm sorry, from the gray line to the blue line to the yellow line to the red line, a dose-response relationship. The more of these genetic variants you, that, are supposed, that look like they foster plasticity or malleability or sensitivity to the environment that you carry, the more you're affected for better and for worse. Um, so some of us are highly susceptible and some of us are not particularly susceptible. Here we now look at the same kind of question. We're looking at the quality of parenting in adolescence, now predicting hostile romantic relationships. Again, this time we have another five genes and we have the same dose-response relationship. I mean, it's rather striking. There's this gradient of the degree to which we look susceptible. And I say look susceptible because, again, we're dealing with observational data. We're dealing with correlations. So can we move beyond correlational evidence to experimental evidence and get a better handle on cause and effect? Well, there's more and more evidence suggesting that we can. And we already have heard that these intervention programs have heterogeneous effects. Some people aren't affected. Well, this framework suggests that should be the case. We should expect that. The question is, can we identify who will be affected and who will not? Well, let's take advantage of what we've already observed about what characteristics seem to make people more and less sensitive to, their envi to environmental influence. So let's begin with infant negative emotionality. Here's an experimental study done using the circle of security to promote sensitive mothering, which is the most direct influence on infant attachment security. What do we see? That for those kids who were low in irritability as newborn babies, there's no effect of the intervention on their probability of developing secure. That's the yellow line, it's a flat line. This intervention only worked in promoting attachment security in those kids who were highly irritable as newborns. Here's another intervention, this one carried out with African children in South Africa, in the township, one of the townships, very poor, using a different intervention strategy, and now looking at the moderating effect of that serotonin transporter gene. Once again, carrying the short alleles made you susceptible, it seems like. Because on the left-hand side, the, on the left-hand side, we see the difference between those carrying short alleles and not, th those carrying short alleles and not, and those, ca those carrying short alleles, one or two of them, and on the right-hand side, we see those carrying only long alleles, the opposite version, and the intervention only worked in promoting security, as you can see in the kind of gray bars, for the kids who were carrying short alleles. In other words, did this intervention promote attachment security as it was theorized to do? The answer is yes and no again. It did for those who were thought to be genetically susceptible, but not for those who weren't. So they were susceptible on the upside, not just to risk. Here we see a video intervention done to reduce externalizing behavior um, carried out in the Netherlands, looking now this time at the dopamine receptor gene. What I want you to pay attention to is the yellow line um, and, I can't see it. And, and, the light, and the light blue line. Because the yellow line is the kids who are in the experimental treatment group. They got the video intervention, or the mothers got the video intervention, and they carried the susceptibility allele, the seven repeat. They start off with the highest problem behavior score and they end up with the lowest. 
In contrast, those who carry the same gene, genetic variant, but are in the control group, the blue line, they end up with the most problems. So that looked like, it looks like that allele inclines you to be vulnerable to adversity, i.e. in this case you're in the control group, but disproportionately likely to benefit from enrichment, you're in the experimental group. Here we see, some of you heard Carol, um, Carolyn Webster Stratton talk yesterday about her, you know, wonderful, well-tested, well-developed, thoughtfully revised, um, incredible years program, intervention program. We asked in, in, in some Dutch data whether or not that program differentially affected boys as a function of their polygenetic makeup using five different um, polymorphin genetic candidates that were available in the data set, selected on an a priori basis. And lo and behold, what do we find? We find on that solid block line that the kids who had the most alleles in the experimental group, the incredible years, they benefited the most. The kids with the least plasticity alleles, the genetic variants thought to make you susceptible, didn't benefit. What we're seeing here is if we don't make these distinctions, we end up with average effect sizes, which might suggest that the program didn't work so well, or it worked good enough. But it may be that it's working terrifically for some and not at all for others. In fact, I wonder if what we're doing, what we're discovering is that we have a rather modest proportion of very susceptible kids who are hugely affected and move the whole average group mean sufficiently so that we get a group difference. And here is a slide that Danny Shore lent me last night after I heard his talk yesterday, because these come from his family checkup study. And he mentioned that they created a polygenic score, and lo and behold, look what happens. If you have the polygenic score, and you're in the control group, that's the solid line, that you're going to have much more um, conduct problems. But if you're in the family checkup experimental group, you have less. So those with the most plasticity genes, again, perform best and worst. The more polygenic score, the, look at the, the horizontal axis, the higher your polygenic score on the right side, the more you're affected, for better and for worse. Conclusions. Differential susceptibility, let's put the two parts of this talk together. Because what I said as I moved to differential susceptibility was that I was going to make the argument that everything I had already said was both right and wrong. Well, let's see if that's the case. And lo and behold, there are two studies that show nicely that the effect of adverse early family environment and a supportive family environment on girls' age of Menarche is genetically moderated by something called the serotonin transporter gene. So you can have the genetic variants of GG, that's the yellow line, the genetic variants of AA, that's the red line, or the mixed genetic variant, the heterozygote, AG. And again, you see that as the quality of the family environment goes up or down, the effect of those family environments on age of Marinaki is different. That for those who have the GG variant, they are affected for better and for worse most strongly. And for those who have the AA variant, no G versions of the, gene of the allele, no, no G alleles of this genetic, uh, of this gene, there's no effect. So again, the question becomes, does the quality of the environment seem to affect age of puberty, a la the theory I advanced? And the answer seems to be yes and no. More so for some than for others in a gradient fashion. We replicated that using different data from a different study we see exactly the same thing. Um, and one of the great challenges is what's called gene by environment and action research is replicating findings. This is a target specific replication. We saw these data coming out of Pittsburgh, Danny's colleague Steve Manick, and we said we can replicate that or we can test the replication and lo and behold it replicated. We can ask the question, let me turn to make a couple of conclusions. Is this enhanced or limited developmental plasticity domain specific or domain general? That is, are some people just highly malleable no matter what the environmental input and almost no matter what the developmental outcome? And are some not so, same being true? Or might it be the case that for some people they're highly malleable in one domain or regard to one sort of influence but not in another? I think about myself actually. 
I seem to have been highly malleable when it came to developmental training. I'm up here, right, after all these years, okay? But I think if you would have tried to train me in music, it would have just been water off a duck's back. It wouldn't have gone any place. So that raises the possibility to me that instead of thinking about some people as really malleable and other people as not and other people as in between, we have a mosaic of malleabilities within us all. And in fact, I would think almost in a bell curve fashion that there were a few people who were malleable, highly responsive to all exposures and all experience with regard to many aspects of development. At the other extreme are those who are as stationary as a rock. They're not responsive to any experiences and any exposures almost, irrespective of any outcome. And in between, we have people who have various makeups of malleability, more malleable and responsive to these experiences, less responsive and malleable vis-a-vis -vis those experiences. What those are remains to be seen. We can also ask if susceptibility, this differential susceptibility, is born or made. The genetic data certainly suggests that it's born, that some of us are born more susceptible than others. But let me just point out, because I didn't have time to go into it, that there's data suggesting that you can, that environmental exposures influence, for example, infant negative emotionality. So if infant negative emotionality is, is being highly negatively emotion is a plasticity factor making you more susceptible and an environmental exposure can upregulate negativity, then maybe it makes you more susceptible. In that sense, environmental susceptibility may be environmentally induced, not just genetically delivered. But I think the real question this work raises is its implications for intervention. And this is something um, that Adrian raised, which has to do with targeting. Um, and whether we believe that we, I, I don't think we're there yet, but I can imagine in 10 years we can screen kids and say, at least with the treatments we have now, we can affect these kids and we can't affect those kids. So what do we do if we have that knowledge? And again, I don't want to in indicate that we can do this right now. Well, do we treat everybody the same? Or do we triage and be strategic about it? And here we have a tension between issues of equity and efficacy. I spent 12 years in London. And every time I raised this issue, people were aghast. You know what? It's a socialist country. Um, and as a consequence, the idea of treating people differently, treating children differently, just was a non-starter. And somehow, what was intriguing to me was the presumption that that was necessarily, obviously, indisputably, the high moral ground. But wait a minute. If all of you over here are susceptible, and all of you over here are not, and I only have limited resources to deliver services, if I try to deliver it to everybody, or at least equally, randomly deliver it to people, then in other words, I am taking resources that won't have an impact and spending them, maybe squandering them, and then being able to serve fewer people for whom it will have an impact. So where's the morality in that? You know, what's very fascinating here is that when it comes to medicine these days, the idea of personalized medicine, the notion of triage, the notion that we have, think, have, have treatments and medications that might work with some and not others and we're gonna follow that strategic lead, nobody seems to object to. But when it comes to behavior and mental health, it's, oh my God, you can't do that. And why is that? I think because we're still operating under this outdated mind-body duality. The notion that the body and the mind are somehow different things. Psychology and behavior, no. The implicit assumption is that's all volitional. That kid's aggressive because he chooses to be, because he's a bad sort. Um, but things happen for other than volitional reasons. And our behavior, you know, certainly when I started 40 years ago, I thought of, I was a mind-body dualist. That behavior was volitional, that it wasn't like, you know, heart disease or diabetes or something like that. But, but there's more and more evidence that that's not so. We've got heritability of behavior. We've got you know, physiology affecting behavior. We have behavior affecting physiology. So this is just an outdated notion that somehow we should treat behavioral behaviors differently than we treat other physical 
things. Um, so I think, you know, th there are these impediments to our thinking is basically part of my take-home message. We've got a mind-body duality. We've got a romanticized ideal of children. We don't think of development in strategic terms. We, you know, I'd like to know how many people in this room have ever taken a class, not in biology, but in evolutionary biology. I can't raise my hand either. The fact of the matter is, you cannot study and think about and understand any other form of life on this planet, and nobody does who's a serious scholar and scientist, without starting with evolution. Yet, for somehow, we think we can understand humans by totally ignoring that. Um, and I would say, that's like trying to fly a plane without coming to grips with physical gravity. There is biological gravity. Now, biology isn't destiny any more than physical gravity says we can't fly. How did I get here from Japan? If you understand physical gravity, you engineer around it. You have a field of aeronautics. You have lift, you have propulsion. We try to fly human beings without coming to grips with biological gravity. That is perhaps like going up on the cliff and taping, taping feathers to your arms and jumping off and thinking you can fly. I just think there's this... And, and why are we here? Because I think another problem is we have this concept of social science. Well, why did what social science came from? Social science came from the foundational notion that we're different. Jesus, every form of life is different. Worms are different, monkeys are different, humans are different, whales are different, amoebas are different. But somehow we've relegated ourselves to being different from other forms of life so we don't need to understand life on this planet to understand humans. That's like sticking your head in the ground and trying to solve problems. It's not going to work very well. So I would say we have to understand that we are part of the living world and that psychiatry and psychology and social work and economics and history, these are life sciences. These are not social sciences because we are living things, last time I checked. And so we haven't somehow escaped the laws of life on this planet. And ignoring them is risky. Thank you. I'm not going to throw any punches here, Jay. Um, uh, I have to say, very stimulating, exciting talk. We're all lining up to take you on here. But I have to say, to lay out my cards, I'm really on your side. And I'm interested in one of the last things you talked about, and that is this issue of why don't we target certain individuals and give them the resources that they greatly need, given that otherwise we're just wasting a whole lot. And where's the morality in that? That's what you said. But, so, and you gave some of the challenges or the obstacles, but I think one of the obstacles is that if we load the resources into that selected group, it's going to be perceived as discriminatory because that group is always correlated with race. That group is what? Say that again. Race, ethnicity. Oh. The group that we target with those resources, to, with respect to violence, the topic of this conference, is loaded, is biased towards minority groups. So uh, when, when I've given your arguments to people, people have come back to me on that, the issue of it will be racially discriminatory. And I understand that argument, and my question is, how, do you, how would you respond uh, to, to, to that um, challenge. Yeah, um, you know, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this about two or three years ago, and I was just astonished with the extent to which I was accused of racism and you just don't want to serve, you know, black people and this and that. And it was kind of like, gee, I thought the readers of the New York Times would have above average reading comprehension, but according to online comments, that wasn't so. I guess, you know, the question becomes, um, and 
So to take, the Afri take, take the intervention that was done in South Africa. That was entirely black population. But there was genetic variance within it. So I think, I look at it this way, which is why do you have African Americans disproportionately respond, you know, behaving like this? Well, they may be equally susceptible, the variation in their susceptibility, but they're way loaded with adversity exposure. So the trick to me would be, I don't want to target race, I want to target more proximate things, because I don't think all black kids or all white kids or all green kids or all yellow kids are going to be equally susceptible. I think there's going to be variation in those populations in the same way there are in other populations. So I would simply say, if we're targeting African American kids more, it's because you've got more susceptibility, you've got not more susceptible kids, you've just got more adverse exposures. Now, now, the problem with that answer is, it's complicated, and for those who are politically reactive, they stopped listening a long time ago. So I think, you're, I think it's real. Thank okay. you, Jay. Greetings. Let me go here first. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> very provocative talk, thank, thank you. Um, I guess I, we know that poverty crushes kids. We know that poverty is what? Crushes kids. Crushes kids. Well, some, Not yes. All of them, but but, it, of them. but overall, of them. it's one of the strongest effects. When yesterday, when the comment came up, uh, what's a, a unifying factor in all these studies, it's poverty as much as IQ. So, I mean, so I guess the issue is this. I think you've, you've identified groups that are more susceptible because of specific gene related variants. And I think. And temperament. Right. And so if you're going to do interventions around those particular traits, it makes sense to target certain groups. But that's a limited universe. We've only tested like teeny amounts of genes. And so the, the danger is that we don't give up on, on trying to work with kids. And in epigenetics, that's why I wanted to ask you how you would work epigenetics into, well, into your okay. talk. Okay. Let me, before I get to epigenetics. Yes. Um, I've already slipped through the part I wanted. Okay, let me get the epigenetics. So I remember that part. Oh. Well, the, uh, I, the question was about specific gene. We've only done a very oh, small okay. number of genes. Yeah. You see, my great, what's fascinating about the set of genes I identified, they all come out of a psychiatric genetic literature that links genes directly with, genes directly with dysfunctions and disorders. My argument is these are genes not of a, of, of a disorder, but of a susceptibility. And so we, what I'm trying to do is suggest that in the same way we have traits like aggression and intelligence and agreeableness and neuroticism, there's another trait running around out there with it, which is environmental susceptibility. And we ought to go have a science measuring that rather than just picking up these random indicators which were never selected for that purpose. So I agree entirely. In terms of epigenetics, what I think is going on is, in fact, for susceptible kids, what you're do, what they're, what's happening is those exposures, good or bad, are affecting their epigenome and therefore their development. But for the other kids, their epigenome is probably impervious. In fact, I asked Michael Meany one day, um, Michael, is it possible that one of the reasons, because he was, you know, he's like the foundational father, his, his epigenetic work, and I said, is it possible that one of the reasons you've got this fantastic epigenetic mediation cascade of environmental effects on development, which actually I should tell you, which people forget about, is outcomes that he looked at were not just stress responsiveness, but were age of sexual maturation and sexual behavior and parenting, i.e. reproductive strategy. But that's lost in the discourse on Michael Meaning's rat study. But the thing is, I said to Michael, is it possible that you got all these great effects because of the strain of rat you were working with? They're all clones. They're all genetic and identical. He said, it's interesting you say that, Jay, because I have colleagues at other labs and other universities who have different strains of rats, and they don't replicate these findings. Wow. So I think we're going to... And what's really interesting about this is, let's say... And this goes to your question about we shouldn't stop if a, if a treatment isn't working, we shouldn't give up on the kids. 
Here's the, here's the possibility, a pharmaceutical possibility. What if we have kids who are exposed to adversity um, and we know they're epigenetically affected and they succumb? We, we may not be able to change their developmental history, but we may be able to change their epigenome pharmacologically and all of a sudden methylate or demethylate their genes. By the same token, let's imagine we have kids who are not susceptible and we're trying to give them an enrichment. Can we turn on their epigenome pharm pharmacologically? And what's interesting here is this is exactly what Meany did in his rat study. When he wanted to confirm that the mother's, the, 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 the mother dan mother's licking and grooming of the newborns is what was causing the epigenetics and therefore the downstream effects, after they had shown the first findings, they went back and they took the ones who, they took another group, they licked it, they had them licking and grooming, and they used an antagonist, a pharmaceutical agent, and they blocked the epigenome from changing. And lo and behold, the licking and grooming no longer worked. So there is a model of intervening at the epigenome level, in rats, not humans, and thereby changing the previous effect of exposure. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was a fun position. I mean, the, the big question I would probably turn back was the question you asked me. So what? I mean, what does it really matter? If it's a uh, disorder, we, I categorize it as a disorder, and you categorize it as an impact that's an, um, a, um, an adaptive response to that situation for the genes. I don't give a damn about anybody's genes. I give a, bad, I give a damn about whether the person is living the best life that they could live. Well, but and clearly, I, the person that's suffering through all those sorts of things is not living the best life that they can live. Right, but, but it seems to me that, and this is as much a medical, theoretical, and even an existential issue, which is how we think about human development. And I started with the critique of this enlightenment thinking where we kind of think that if we fertilized every flower, we would get roses. That is, that, that there's this idealized way of developing, secure or autonomous, achievement striving, intimate, parent devoted, that that is the natural course of development. And, 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 and then when it comes to the deviants, we think of them as broken or disordered, as opposed to making strategic thoughtful responses that no longer fit in the current world. Because that partly raises the issue that the problem may be with the context as much as with the person. So, that, that, so, 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 so I, I agree with you that it may be... But that you, you just said, I I'm, I'm, will shut up after this, but you just said strategic thoughtful. Yet earlier on your, your talk, you specifically said these weren't strategic and thoughtful. These were, you know, these, these are not that the person is planning this sort of stuff. This is just a biological no, no. result of what's going on. No, and again, I'm, just getting rid of it. Just go away. Again, again, I'm not talking. We, the, the question is whether you want people to be as happy as possible. And if you don't care, I mean, you're saying that's the Enlightenment view, and that might be true. But I actually, I, yeah, I proudly say I have that view. I want people to be as happy as possible. I really don't care whether their genes are going to be passed on as much as possible. I care about whether they're going to be as happy as possible. And that's why I take on the Enlightenment view. Okay, but this comes back to an issue we had earlier, which had to do with the court issue, which is, you know, if a developing organism who's susceptible in the face of adversity has an old brain, an old body, an old evolutionary, quote, program that says, take advantage of others, hit first and ask questions later, be threat vigilant, and all those things, then all of a sudden, the, the agency that we attribute to that person's choice is very different than if we don't think of that as an adaptive response. I don't want to make the argument that we don't do anything or we just accept that that's nature's script. I think that was nature's script and it worked a while back, probably in a pre-age of pre-civilization. But I think in a contemporary world, we look at the person and we blame the person and we see a moral failing and we say there's free agency and there's free choice and therefore they didn't have to do that. And I don't want to eliminate free choice entirely, but I want to introduce the fact that these responses are, the, are not unlike the responses when you go out in light from a dark room 
your eyes contract, you know, your pupils contract. Um, that's not just a matter of choice. That's a matter of how a mind and a body has evolved to function. Let's go on with that later. Yes. Um, so my mind's being off of that. So in terms of the um, contextual um, and uh, disparity issue. So for instance, if we look at the effects of poverty in the United States, it's much bigger impacts than in countries where poverty is the norm. Um, so if we're looking at the fast versus slow developers, um, what does it mean to be a fast developer in a society like the United States that preferences the slow developer, and how might that be different than um, a norm of fast development or a norm of early sexual um, encounters? And what does the context impact in terms of people who are um, in potentially a stigmatized developmental pattern compared to the um, mainstream, I guess, or the preferenced? Um, I, I'm, not quite sure, I'm not quite sure I understand. So, for instance, um, we're saying that the Enlightenment view is the norm within Western societies and within the United States. Um, so what does it mean to be a fast developer in a society that um, preferences the Enlightened view versus a fast developer in a country where that is the norm? And what does that mean for interventions here in the United States? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things, you know, one of the interesting questions becomes, is it absolute deprivation or relative deprivation. Um, so in a society where there's endemic poverty, um, is harshness affecting everybody the same way or do you see yourself as similar to everybody else? I mean, does the body see itself? And if it does, how does it process that? Where in a more con vari a society with greater variance, um, is it your absolute impoverishment or lack of resources or at the relative? I, I don't know. I want to leave you with one appreciation here, because I think, oh, I still have five minutes? Okay, let me just emphasize this point. If this perspective has any truth to it about people being, vary being varying in their susceptibility, what it raises the possibility is that these adversities, as we already know, carry human, huge human capital costs. But they're not just human capital costs as suggested by the dual risk model, which is we're losing capability. It's suggesting not only are we losing capability, but we're losing upside potential. So that we have a kid who is now in jail who could have been starting a company in Silicon Valley that we'd be benefiting from for 30, 40 years. Um, and that's a huge societal cost. You know, I wonder sometimes what if Steve Jobs was a highly sensitive plastic individual? He was adopted. And what if he was adopted into a more supportive and enriched environment than he would have otherwise had? We would not, if he hadn't been adopted, we wouldn't have Apple. Think about, and I want to, and this comes back to this, think, what I want you to think about is the ripple effect of the cost of losing the Steve Jobs of the world because they grow up under disadvantage. The disadvantage, the cost is not just to Steve Jobs and who he mugs on the corner. The disadvantage is to all of us, perhaps. And this has something to say, I want to respond to something said about how we look at effect sizes. Oh, 0.24, it's not very big. We need to consider cumulative effects of small risks. What's more important? Small effects that apply to many or big effects that apply to few? There's classic work showing that the more externalizing behavior you have in a kindergarten class, the more the kids who don't have behavior problems develop behavior problems. So they haven't been exposed necessarily to the family risk of the kids who are acting out. But they become, you know, they're kind of, a, they become psychosocial identical twins. That's an effect we never measure. So we get a small effect size of 0.24. Ask yourself, what happens in a first grade classroom when instead of having five acting out kids in a class of 30, you only have two because three have been somewhat reduced? Yes. Okay. But well, we heard from one, but you're right. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, first, I just wanted to ask, just because I thought it was really, really funny, uh, who was it who said the UK is a socialist country? <laughs> uh, uh, the Republicans. The Republicans? No. That's, 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 
I'm Canadian, so that just blows my mind. But it, that's really, really funny. Um, so uh, I think the, the general uh, conversation here uh, made me think quite a bit of uh, what little familiar, uh, familiarity I have with uh, uh, now deceased uh, fellow Canadian uh, J. Philip Rushton. Uh, and thinking about his, uh, the, the controversy about the application of uh, RK selection theory uh, in terms of the, the fast uh, and slow life histories. This is RK selection theory. Okay, good. I'm glad I'm on the right track. Uh, so the, I think they, I want to frame my question uh, in the right way, which is that I can't ask what the state of the science is because that's too big of a question. But I think one thing that could be a helpful question is, uh, basically, I'm wondering what the state of the conversation is, especially within the, the professionals who discuss around these issues. We've, we've talked about uh, racism. We've talked about discrimination. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of wondering what the state of the conversation is about things like uh, race, racial essentialism, that kind of controversy. And the reason I, reason I ask that is because Within the groups, you, you mentioned the, the study in, in South African townships. That's talking, uh, you know, intra-racial or intra-group uh, variation, and the, the degree of variation. I think the, the point that's important to make is that uh, controversially, but significantly, especially if we're going to do good social science, there may be differences of the allele frequencies across the, the ethnocultural groups. And, and I think that's, that's sort of uh, the main thought there. But, uh, I mean, I, I really feel like we're skirting around, uh, skirting around the issue. Um, Can I just respond? Yeah. There are, you know, until I got into this problem, I didn't understand what the field of population genetics was about. But there are differences in these, in genetic makeup across populations. In fact, here's an interesting observation. The serotonin transporter gene, which I mentioned, is more frequent in Asia than it is here. The dopaminergic, the dopamine receptor gene that I mentioned is more frequent in the West than it is in East Asia. Yeah. Um, and so that raises an interesting question, which is, is the percentage of highly malleable people within a population constant around the world? Well, I mean, I, I think I, I appreciate your optimism, but I mean, there, I think there seems to be a, an overfocus on malleability here. Um, on what? My, uh, I, I mean, there, there's a strong emphasis, at least, on, on malleability in your presentation. Um, and and I, I suppose I'm just trying to balance that out by, by uh, the more... So I'll lay it out very straight. I've had a several conversations. I'm a current university student in British Columbia. I'm at the University of British Columbia. I'm fairly well connected in terms of what the ongoing youth culture is, sort of free speech movement on the campus that's kind of weird around the edges right now. I'll keep it brief. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we're having, and I mean, I'm a philosophy student, we study across different uh, social issues, is that we don't know what the state of science is on gender and race essentialism. We don't know what that is. Uh, we don't know where the state of the science is. We're not allowed to talk about it. It is utterly taboo. You can't bring it up with people. And the problem is, I mean, for me, one of the most shocking, and, and I said to my professor of social and political philosophy in private conversation, one of the most shocking and important social facts, if there's any truth to it whatsoever, is the race and IQ correlation that I came across in my entire uh, post-secondary uh, uh, academic uh, experience. And the reason for that is if there is, now there's no justification for discrimination. You know what, I, I've been told to wrap it up and there's one person behind okay, you. I'm so sorry, can I, I ask you to wrap it up too? I'll keep, I'll keep it brief. So, so the, the reason why I'm wondering, the question is, I'm wondering what the state of the conversation is about this topic, especially within the professional researchers. And the reason why I'm wondering uh, about that, and I'll, this will be my last sentence, is that we're not allowed to talk about these issues, uh, and it's creating problems because when people are getting access to this information, if it's being kept under the surface, if there is any genetic component to it, if there is any difference between the groups, uh, basically, and I'll keep it very controversial, good way to end, is uh, uh, it is helping to feed uh, uh, countercultural movements like the alt-right. It's helping to feed these movements by giving a little bit of a taste of forbidden information that seems to resonate with some people, 
But I, I just need to know what the state of the conversation is okay. in academia. We, we can talk your about response, that afterwards. That's a big yeah. issue. Your sure. response is the, the end of the conversation, I'm afraid. Can, can, there's one more question you can't comment? It's uh, already behind you. If it's a quickie. I okay. mean, <laughs> Liz. Hi, Beth Kaufman. Great talk right, today. Thank yeah. you. Nice to Beth see you. Um, I'm, I'm throwing you a question that I often get asked, looking at your fast, slow, live course, of course, early puberty with the, with the fast. Adolescent brain development. Many of the questions I get asked, can we accelerate the brain development? Because if we know the frontal lobe of the brain helps self-regulate, is you know, the impulse control regulator, we know that's a good thing to have. Should we be accelerating brain development so that we actually get kids being more mature faster? There is evidence in the paper I referred to that's coming out. There's evidence that the brain connectivity between the frontal lobes and the amygdala that we see emerging in adolescence under the face and adversity occurs earlier in middle childhood. Um, and there are three different studies now that, that highlight this. And, you know, Larry Steinberg has raised the possibility that, that what we're actually doing is truncating plasticity by that accelerated brain development. And there are other biological indicators besides puberty and that brain connectivity that acceleration is going on. So Thank you. Good.